Welcome to this week's video. It's been a while since I made a furniture build, so I wanted to try something a little bit different and walk you through my thought process. Before we get going, make sure to click that subscribe button down below and hit that bell icon too, so you're notified every time that we release a new video. Right, take your seats and shh, I'm about to talk. So the other day, I get a call from my mate Chris. It goes a little bit something like this. Hey Will. Yes Chris mate, how's it going? I've got a nice piece of oak if you want it. Oak? When do you want it? Anytime mate. See you in 30 minutes. So this is the oak that Chris brought round. It's an old fire surround so it's plenty dry. But the downside to that is, it has lots of twists and cupping, with some big cracks too. The first job therefore is to get one side nice and flat. If I was to put this through the thicknesser the way it stands, it would just follow the wood, albeit a nice smooth surface, but just with the same defects. So to remedy this, I use a piece of MDF to reference as a flat surface for the oak to sit on. The oak is shimmed using offcuts of MDF. You would be better using the plastic type shims, which are normally used for window installation, but I didn't have any to hand and this works just as well. I secure both ends to stop it moving around and now I feel happy that when it goes through the thicknesser, it will create a nice flat surface. I have to admit I am pretty gutted that I found this old screw well hidden in the oak. There was no sign of the metal or the screws on the surface, so I can only guess that when the tree grew, the screws or the nail just became a part of it. So now I have one flat surface from the thicknesser, I can reference this side to the fence of my bandsaw, running it through to create a slab or a plank. I'm using a 1 inch wide 1.32 per inch ripping blade from Beaverstock. Based in Wales in the UK they create fantastic blades which I can wholeheartedly recommend. Why not go and give them a look, their details can be found below in the description. Once I cut the plank I run it back through the fixer to give me another flat surface. Doing this I always give myself one flat reference surface on all of the planks. In total I've got three boards out of this one piece, all around 25mm thick. Using the thicknesser again, I can get all the boards down to one thickness, using that flat surface I talked about to run on the bed of the machine. The final thickness was approximately 20mm. When it comes to designing for the table, I did a lot of researching online and on Pinterest. I've spoken in previous videos how useful this platform is and it really does help get the mind juices flowing. I wanted something that would stand out from other tables. So I went with a three legged design with a round top, using 12mm stainless steel rods to separate the top from the legs by around 10mm. I've done this on another project and I think it worked out really well. I print this design out on A4 paper as this will now be used to create my template. With the design process complete and templates in hand, it's back to the workshop. I cut the template sheets down so I can connect them together with sellotape. Taking the time and making a template will serve two purposes. One, it gives me an idea of what the finished leg is going to look like. For example, size and shape. Is it tall enough in real life? 
is it the right height now that I've got it in a real life scenario? Does it need adjusting from that design? You can do all this without having to make an expensive mistake. Just remember you need to make this template as smooth and clean as possible. It's no good using a rough template as the end product will just look rough. So spend some time sanding and shaping it the best you can. Secondly, repeatability. I can now use this MDF template to lay out on the oak planks. Doing it like this, I can maximize the grain and defects, which in some cases you may want to highlight. And if I was to make this table again in the future, I can just use the same template. Nice and easy, right? Remember, work smarter, not harder. I managed to get all three legs out of one plank, which was great news as it meant I could now make the entire table from the same oak beam. I attach the template to the now roughly cut oak leg using masking tape and super glue. This is a great little tip as it means you can remove the template easily from the oak without the need to clean up any fixings that you may have used. I use a flush trim bit in the router table to follow the template to bring the legs to their final shape. Depending on how close you get to the line on the bandsaw, you may want to take lighter initial cuts, so you don't remove too much material in one go. It puts less pressure on the bit and gives a nicer finish. I then move over to the miter saw to trim the top and bottoms, as these are end grain and can be slightly tricky to cut the router cleanly. You'll see me set the miter saw to 10 degrees, and this is the angle I decided I wanted the legs to splay out away from the tabletop. I can now move on to the cross support pieces. I place two planks on top of one another and using a straight edge to clamp them together I run this against my table saw fence. In short what I am doing is jointing the boards. Like I did at the start with the thicknesser I am referencing the clamp which I know to be straight onto the wood so when it gets machined it will give me a nice straight edge. I then start cross cutting the pieces to their final dimensions using an off cut glued onto the fence as a stop block. Using a digital angle gauge I set my blade to 30 degrees, adjusting the fence so I can sneak up to the cuts for where I need it. Now with them all together, you can see that triangle shape I designed in SketchUp. I am going to be joining the legs and the cross pieces using biscuits. You can even use dowels if you wanted to, or a domino if you're lucky to have one. You have to keep in mind the grain direction of the wood, not only for an aesthetics point of view, but structurally too. For example, if you have a small piece where the grain runs in the wrong direction, not only will it weaken that part, but it will also affect any movement in the wood due to environmental conditions. As you can tell, gluing of these pieces are going to be a struggle, as the angles don't have a flat surface to clamp against. To work around this, I use the glue for strength and a small amount of super glue for an instant clamp. When the biscuit swells due to the wood glue in the pocket, it will cure to be a very strong finished joint. With the legs to one side, I can work on what is to become the top. I cut the planks down to just over 400mm in length and then laying them out flat. 
Using a compass I made using a piece of scrap, I make a few initial marks to find a centre point. Then using a pencil I draw my circle. I attach the top together again using biscuits, so they should be a nice tight fit when clamped. Once all the clamps were in place, they were left overnight to fully cure. When it came to sanding the next day, mostly due to my table saw blade needing replacing, I noticed that the joint wasn't as nice and crisp as I had hoped for. It was at this point that I therefore decided to slightly change the design and the look of the table. I took the pieces outside and then using my homemade ebonizing fluid, which is just some white vinegar and wire wool, brushed a liberal amount all over the oak legs. As you can see, the solution which reacts with the tannins within the wood darkens it almost immediately before your eyes, giving it a really nice aged look. With the legs outside drying, I turned my attention back to the top. Straight out of the clamps and using a rough circle cutting jig I made for the bandsaw, I went about turning the slab into its final shape. The circle jig is pretty straightforward. It's a piece of MDF which gets pushed through the blade until it reaches roughly the middle. A line is then drawn perpendicular to the blade, where I can then set out measurements, which will become the radius length of 200mm. I insert a pin at this measurement, which the centre mark of the slab then gets pressed on. The slab is then rotated on this pivot point while the bandsaw is running and creates the final circle with a diameter of 400mm. Off camera I gave the top a good sanding and then I got ready to route in my profiles. Again I have changed my mind of the look of this table and I am now trying to recreate an oak barrel look. Luckily I have taken apart a barrel recently so I know roughly what shape I should be aiming for. I first use a panel cutting bit, which is normally used for kitchen cabinetry. Using the pin that comes with my router insert, I ease the top into the cutter, making initial light cuts, before I then take more aggressive deeper cuts. Once this was completed, I changed the bit to a roundover, and proceeded to ease the underside and then the top. This gave a really nice look to the table, and broke any hard edges. Off camera I then used my laser cutter to design this Jack Daniel stencil. Using the spray paint as a mask, the stencil is removed to show a nice clean finish. Off camera I coat the tabletop in my ebonizing fluid and allow this to dry. Once that's all done, I can sand back the spray paint that had blocked the stain getting through and makes the lettering now stand out. You'll see this more when I come to finishing the table. Neat little trick huh? Back to the router table I changed to a chamfering bit. 
the outer sides get a nice deep highlighting pass, whereas the inner gets a softer, lighter pass. Once all that was finished, I set about laying out the legs. Using some super glue, temporarily I attached them together. This makes things a lot easier, as I now need to drill holes and insert some screws. This is going to be how the legs are held together. Now I would have liked to have some glue in there as well, but when I tried to back one of the screws out, it snapped, and it would have been incredibly difficult to remove this now sunken broken screw. I wasn't too worried as I knew the screws would hold this together very well. I then went about enlarging the holes and then topped it with a walnut plug. The plugs now hide the head of the screw and adds another visual part to the end piece. As I said at the start, when designing this table I had a previous build in mind. In that table I had used 12mm stainless steel rods to create a floating top. Sadly however, when it came to doing this in practice, it just didn't look right. So I ended up drilling out the holes to insert the rods deeper. So when the top is attached, it sits right on top of the legs. I think now having the piece completed, I made the right choice. And it goes to show that plans are all well and good, but as a woodworker, you must be able to adapt to situations just like this. The plugs are cut using a Japanese style flush cut saw. I picked this one up in Lidl during one of their tool events, and I have to say I absolutely love it. Masking tape will protect my table while mixing the epoxy. This is just 5 minute epoxy but is incredibly strong and once cured after approximately 1 hour it will be solid. The epoxy is generously applied to all the holes and pins so fill any voids created while drilling. While the glue is drying I use the sander to create a small chamfer on the feet. I do this so when the table is moved around it doesn't splinter the wood. When finishing my go to finish has to be Osmo Polyox. It's a wax and oil mix that is incredibly durable and is resistant to heat so it has to be perfect should anyone forget a coaster when they put their hot drinks onto the table. Two coats are applied and on each occasion I use a scotch pad to denib any raised grain from the wood. I think it looks absolutely stunning and it will become a welcome addition to my growing collection of furniture that I sell. Did you know that I sell all of my furniture over on my website? Why not come over and check it out at www.whcreations.co.uk